introduce Rich Hoven. He's going to talk about hand-hewn barns of the 1800s, and I'll turn it over to Rich. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, as he said, my name is Rich. Uh, forget the last name, just Rich, uh, in name only. <laughs> I started out having an interest in barns probably like the, the rest of you, at a very young age. My grandfather had a 40 by 60 thrashing barn, and thrashing barns are my, my specialty, the, my big love. Um, a thrashing barn is one that has the double doors on either side, and some of them you might have seen have the double doors where you can drive in, and then the other double doors, you often wondered what the heck they were for because it was, you know, it's like a one-story drop off the back. So we're going to learn a little bit about that. We're going to learn a little bit about uh, hand-hewn barn beams uh, as opposed to sawn barn beams or modern-day construction now. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about how they were built and how did they get those big timbers up there? Because they didn't put them up one at a time. Uh, so we're going to get started with the fact that every farm had a woodlot. Now, the farmers coming into this area, which this side of, the, uh, uh, of Albany was frontier. Um, it was nothing out here but a few Native Americans. Um, but the farmers, they didn't practice good uh, land conservation back in those days. And what would happen is your soil would be used for the same thing, wheat, corn, beans, whatever, and it would wear out the soil. So what they would do is they'd pick up and move and move and move and move, and so on and so forth. So let's start in this area up in here, and we'll go back to the uh, early 1800s, uh, where I'm from is, well, I live in Clyde now, but uh, Phelps, Clifton Springs. Phelps was uh, late, uh, I think it was 1797, uh, that they first had their first log cabin. Oaks Corners was one of the first. This area started uh, Genesee Country, uh, area started having an influx of people. But the, just imagine nothing but trees out here and beautiful lands and a guy, a young guy and his wife and kids would come out or maybe they'd start their family after they came out. And he convinced her this is a great idea. We're going to come out here and we're going to farm. Everybody farmed because that was their way of life. There was no Lowell's and Walmart and whatnot like that, so you had to make do with what you had. So the first thing that they would do is clear enough land so that they could build their thrashing barn. That's where they would thrash their wheat that they hoped to, to grow. And... The family sometimes stayed in the barn the first year until they could build the log cabin. The barn was that important. That was the first building that came up, then your log cabin. Now, it's a, interesting, and you can look at it later, of what a farm actually looked like. First pages here shows a farm in the late 1700s, and by 1805, they'd cleared off the land and started their farming a little bit more like we know farming today. Um, you'll notice in some of the pictures that when they cut down their trees for their barn and their log cabin, they left the stumps right where they were. That was secondary. They'll move them later, but they had to get their crops in. So they used to plow around the stumps, and that was their original field. So everybody had a woodlot, and the first thing they had to do if they're going to build a barn is they had to get in touch with a master craftsman. 
the master craftsman was a real close guarded secret on how to build barns and keep them standing. Uh, he would have some apprentice. He would work for the barter system, room, lodging, some food, whatever. And he would come in and he would supervise building the barn. So he would, uh, ahead of time, he'd tell the, uh, you always wanted to work your wood green if you can. It's a lot easier to work. And you'll see why in a minute, green. He would instruct the farmer to go out, and he'd go out in the wood lot, and he'll say, okay, I need that tree, that tree, that tree, and that one over there. And they would go out and cut the trees down. Does everybody know what this is? It's a two-man buck saw, all right? Cross cut. All right. My dad taught me how to use this, and I could never find another dummy to get on the other end to try it. I'd love to try it one more time. Um, his teaching methods were uh, rather unique. Uh, he said, uh, you go out, and he says, all you got to do is pull on that end. Yeah. And he says, and I'll pull on that end. He says, whatever you do, he borrowed my grandfather's saw. He says, whatever you do, don't push. Because you push, you're going to bend the saw, and it's not any good. Well, the minute he saw me pushing, he would pull it and yank harder. And my hands up against the tree, the knuckles oh, snap, you know. I learned after a couple of pulls that he was going to pull. I got to pull. But that's the cross-cut saw, that, a two-man, that they would use to down the logs to your barn. I don't want to shave anybody's head here. Is there a reason the teeth are different at the exteriors? I'm sorry? Is there a reason why the teeth are different at the ends? It just clears out the uh, sawdust and the wood chips <laughs> as you go along. And the blades, the points would be offset a little bit. Otherwise, if they were right in line, it would bind up on the tree and you'd never be able to cut with it. So now we got the log and usually the farmer had uh, a big old workhorse, and the horse would be used for many other things, but he'd have a good workhorse. If he was lucky, he'd have an oxen or a team of oxen. And those, uh, the oxen were much stronger, uh, harder working animal than the horse, but it was a little harder to get a hold of, train, and so on and so forth. So in the meanwhile, he'd hook up the team, and he'd haul his logs up to the, the uh, building site. Now the building site on the original barns was generally a flat piece of property. They would take uh, maybe four cornerstones or maybe six, a couple on the side, and they would put the sill beams down on that and build the barn up from there. The little thrashing barns that you see are about 30 by 40 um, in size. That's about the size of a two-car garage, roughly. That would probably be, what, 25 by 25, so a little bit bigger than that. And they would be three bays. You would have the center bay, which will end up with the wooden floor for the thrashing, and you would have Two other bays, one would be your mow, your hay mow, and the other bay would be a hay mow. However, the ones I liked would have a little stanchion for an ax or a workhorse. It would have a granary, just a small wooden room, sealed up, hopefully the mice wouldn't chew through it, and the other section would be like for your milk cow and a calf. Uh, chickens ran free, pigs ran free, cows generally ran free too. Uh, fencing at that point was to keep critters out of your garden um, as opposed to what we use fencing for now is to keep cattle in. So once you got your barn site, uh, we'll talk about the 30 by 40 thrashing barn that has the double doors on either side and it has what they call four bents. The bents, and I'll keep it simple for myself, has 
two posts and a beam across and some braces. And there are four bents that make up the barn to give it the three bays. Uh, each of these bents had to be put up as a unit. So the first thing they do is they bring in, well, we already talked about the first thing, they, uh, they would cut the logs and haul them in. And now the logs lay in there and it has to be debarked. This is a debarking tool. This one, if you notice, all my tools, I tried to get them into the 1800s. This is all hand forged. A lot of farmers would have their own little small forge for building simple things like this or nails. Nails were very precious back then, gate latches and so on and so forth. The more complicated stuff, eventually um, you would have a blacksmith move into the area to start forming your villages. But this is a debarking tool. Simply get down there under the bark and strip all the bark off of the logs that you're going to cut into beams. Now if you're a little taller person and you didn't like to stoop down, and kind of keep an eye and let me know when I hit about the 45 minute mark. Okay. This is another debarking tool. This is all a hand forge. This came out of uh, Fayette, New York. I was in a guy's yard sale laying with some uh, shovels and rakes and him and his wife were just clearing out their barns and I knew what it was and I was hoping he didn't. And, <laughs> and I said, how much you want for it? He said, a buck. I said, okay. Well, I'll take it. Now, do you know what it is? And he said, well, I think. Turned out that his wife's grandfather was a blacksmith over on Route 89, Leader Road and 89 in Seneca County, uh, near Fayette, south of Seneca Falls. And we suspect that the grandfather had made this. But this is another debarking tool. It's just a little bit bigger for taller people and it did the job very nicely. We got the bark off the tree and now we want to make square logs out of the round logs. So we would put the log up on something of comfortable height, could be something about that high. Um, you're going to want to stand on it, so you use what they call a log dog to pound into your stabilizer and your log to keep it from rolling. This is barn making, not uh, lumberjacking. You don't want the log to roll. And we're going to fix the size, picture a log like this, and we want to make a square in there. Now one of the ways to make a square in there would be, does everybody know what this is? Plumb bob. And you all know that the plumb bob, once it stops wiggling, is going to go because of gravity straight up and down. You would mark out your log, the square that you wanted to work to, chalk it up, the line, and snap a line on the end of your log. You'd roll it over until you got all four. Now you know what size beam you wanted to make out of that log. Now they didn't have tape measures. A lot of times what they'd use is a divider. They'd set it for the, the width that they wanted. And I think this one is a little bit clearer. It's almost one-third, one-third, and one-third. So you had something that you'd use. Here's your pencil. That's a scriber. You would scribe your lines on there. You would then take a line chalk, chalk it up, two people job, 
you got a square on this end, take it right down there, snap a line, and now you have a line on your round log to whereas you got to start work to. <coughs> Excuse me, allergies. <coughs> the next thing that you would do is you'd walk along the log. You've got your line. And you would take your handy dandy axe. This is not an original handle, but the, the head is. <coughs> and you would stand down here and you would come in, and that is called scoring to the line. I think you've probably heard some terminology of working to the line or scoring to the line. That's where that came from. About a 15 degree angle, you take your felling axe and you just come in and score right to the line. Now, the reason for scoring down through here is you don't want, on the next process, you got to start removing the material. And if you didn't have the score lines, uh, this thing could run any place. When you started splitting wood, if it's got a little twist or turn to it, uh, it's going to follow that. You want to keep this as flat as possible. So if you score down through here, and then I'll show you the next step, it's easier to slice off chunks and keep that nice and square. All right, from there, you go to a little bit bigger axe. And, and it is heavy. And if this were in working condition, I will guarantee you this would be razor sharp. So with the razor sharp, the weight of it, this is uh, called a broad axe. Okay? And if you notice, one side is flat. The other side has your typical axe configuration. There's a reason behind that. There's a reason why the handle is bent too. Right hand or left hand, you want to get your hands back and you don't want it anywhere near the log. You end up bruising your knuckles. Now what you would do, picture this over here and probably about this high off the ground. You would then start walking along the side of the log and you're going to start slicing off what you've already scored. Hence the flat side would give you the flat con configuration. Now keep in mind this thing is heavy and you're welcome to pick up any of these tools um, afterwards, look at them, uh, play with them, be careful. A couple of them still have a little edge onto them. Uh, most of my tools are not in working condition. They're only for show and tell. Uh, they won't let me have any sharp tools. <sighs> I think I'll have to ask my doctor next time why you won't let me have any sharp tools. Anyway, not to worry. You would walk along the edge of the log and with a downward swing, you would come down and shear off and make this flat. Now keep in mind, how many of you have worked with logs and found stones growing in them, knots in them, little bits of iron? I don't think they had to worry too much back then about iron. But I wonder how many times the guy went down with that sharp ax and hit something sharp and had to zing off. It was, yeah. Not a very nice job, but Nevertheless, one that had to be done. So now we got the log square. You roll over, you square off the next side. Keep doing that, obviously, for four sides. And you have your first beam. Now you can see why all these funny little marks. It wasn't because they were lousy craftsmen. As you'll see, they were very uh, intelligent about the master craftsman was about how he made these. But at least now you know what a hand-hewn log is. 
Now, the next thing is you got to do, and you can take a look at this. Just take my word for it. My fingers are not that flexible. There is a pocket up here called a mortise. It's a rectangle hole that you are eventually going to put another log that has a tendon on it. This one's not all there. And you want to be able to have a light press fit into here. And we'll find out in a little bit why that is. But keep in mind as we're building this barn, this would be a cross beam. So it's probably going to be from that divider over here long. Okay, mine's nice and short and I can pick it up and I can explain what's going on. This one's going to be a post and that's going to be up there a lot higher, a little higher than the ceiling up here. Okay, weight wise, just keep it in mind. But you want a nice press fit, light fit in here. You don't want it sloppy, and you don't, but you do want it to go in there. So with that in mind, we're going to start out with the mortise. And you would start drilling. Now this one, when you come up here, you'll see there's three holes in here. They're all two inch holes and there's three of them in there. So I'm suspecting the guy had to go up here and he had to start boring down until he got to the depth that he wanted. Now that's a pretty good sized bit and that's still not big enough. That's, that's still too sloppy in there. So you can imagine the labor intense and drilling that out. When they first started using drills, they were kind of flat on the bottom. This has a little cutting edge right here, okay? But you, you know, this thing's going to want to travel when you're so you had to take a little gouge and kind of make a little cone-shaped divot in your wood. And you go down, and this would be much bigger, and start drilling out your hole. They came along with the idea, well, let's twist the drill and put still the flat, just a little point, it's an angle, Let's twist the drill and the wood will start coming out. Made it a little bit easier, but keep in mind, this thing's about two inches in diameter. Then somebody come up with the idea to put the little screw on the end of, and I'm sure that all the drills that you've seen, the older drills, they all have this little screw on here. Well, you didn't have to do a starter. That would be your starter hole and it would also help to draw down as you're turning it. So I made it a little bit easier. Again, you're going to have a bigger drill than this, and that's going to be a lot of work. Just for one mortise, there's three holes in there that they had to do. Somebody came up with the idea, <laughs> and my late wife, called this a man's tool, and I go, yeah, it's a man's tool. I mean, goodness, look at this thing. Wow. It's heavy, it's big, it's bulky. So why do you call it a man's tool? She says, how do you work it? Hmm. I said, well, I sit down here, and she goes, aha, it must be a man tool, sit down job, right? Now, ladies, around the house, you're washing dishes, you're doing clothes, you're ironing. Are you sitting down to do that? No, no. Where's dad? Dad's out riding on the lawnmower to mow the lawn, and I can think of about six other things that he's sitting down working at, right? So Karen called this the man tool. Anyways, you would place it on the beam over the top of where you wanted to drill the hole, and as you can see, they had the new and improved screw on the end. And again, this is still not two inches in diameter. 
I did use this last year, and I want to tell you, it bites in and it drills fast. I just was trying to sit on a 4x4 four four and didn't have enough stability on the floor, and my old body just wasn't sitting right on it. But as you turned it, it did. It bored down very easily. Now this is called a boring machine and you would crank the handles as you sat down and this would turn the bit. Now this has a unique feature to it. Let's see. I'll smash my fingers here. It's got a lock up here. Unlock it, position it on the log, sit down, drill out your hole, and then you can come up later. There's a little bar that you swung over here. And when you started turning this again, it would reverse itself back out and lock into place. Okay? Then you could take and move it down a little bit, a couple inches, and drill another hole, another hole. So that was a boring machine, uh, a man's tool. And that made a whole mess of improvements. Now, some of them you might have seen are fixed post. I have one that's a fixed post. This one was adjustable. I'm suspecting that if you had to start drilling for some of your braces on an angle, you could set this at an angle and still bore down in. So it was kind of a neat little invention. How All right. did the farmer get that? I'm sorry? How would the farmer get a device like that? He wouldn't. He wouldn't because if you remember I started out, there's a master craftsman that would bring the tools and his apprentice and he would have all those. Um, the farmer's lucky to have uh, a hammer, you know, and uh, maybe some wrought iron to make some nails and he might have some saws and uh, and a couple other metal things, but he's just starting out. He's a farmer. Uh, the master craftsman was the barn builder. Yes, sir? What's the preferred species of wood they use? Uh, anything that's out in your woodlot. Uh, they generally tried to use American chestnut, which that is a seed from American chestnut. It's a small one. That is a piece of American chestnut. I think it was cut a gazillion years ago, and it's rot resistant. So they would try to use the American chestnut, that's got a little oil finish onto it, for the sills, so they wouldn't rot out. But they could use pine. Now you gotta remember, the, the trees back then were new growth trees. You know, they're good size, slow growing trees. Uh, so the grain was much tighter. I have seen in barns uh, some beams that were made out of oak. Um, maybe oak, uh, pine. Um, you wouldn't want to use locusts. Uh, I'll tell you what locusts is good for later. Uh, but those are maple. Um, eventually, they went more towards pine because it was available and they liked the hardwoods for maybe making furniture, eventually. But the, the first settlers in this area, this, whatever tree worked, if it was big enough and solid enough, uh, that's what they would use. All right, so we got three holes bored in here, but now I said that we needed a press fit, a light press fit in here. So how are we going to square off that hole in there? Well, we could start with a chisel and your mallet. This one looks like it might have been even pine at one time. I'm not sure, which is strange. I would have used a harder wood. Your chisel's got a flat side to it, and you go down and start chiseling out. Now you get to the corners and you could take and try to make a nice neat corner. But they had another tool. Somebody come up with the idea of taking two chisels, idea of two chisels. And it's called a corner chisel. 
So when you came to the corner, you would drive that down through and chisel it out. You had a nice, tight, fit, sharp corner in there. You've got your mortise now. You know how deep it is. You've got it all sized up. Now you have to make the tenon to go down in there. Everybody knows what this is, right? All right Carpenter square. <clears throat> How many guys in here have some old tools kicking around that they might have inherited or found? That? This one is dated, I think, 1898, 93, somewhere in there. I use this one all the time. When you go home tonight, take a look at your old squares, okay? The old ones, not the new ones. And you'll notice a couple of things. One, one side is always fatter than the other side. One leg's always wider than the other. Anybody know why? That's because if you're building a barn, you want a nice wide tenon. You already have a gauge for it, a two inch wide gauge. You take your scribe, inscribe your line on it, right? If you're building a house, you would use an inch and a half tenon, okay? So it'd be a little bit narrower. There are smaller uh, timbers. The second thing is, if you look real close, and I never noticed this until somebody pointed it out to me, it's thicker down here and thinner up here. Now, I was told the reason being, and it made sense, that a carpenter's using this all day long. He's going to want this thing as light as he can possibly get it because he's handling this up above, down below, wherever. But you don't want to ruin the integrity of your 90 degree angle. Now, you got to remember that when they first started making squares, they were overlapping them and forging them out. So you didn't want to lose that squareness in there. So that's why it's beefier down here. Give it a little more strength, tapered up here so it's a little bit lighter. Not much, but a little bit. All right. We've already used this to lay out this, okay? And we now have to lay out on here. I showed you how we laid out this. Use your dividers to get what you want as far as location, your scribe, your tool. Now we have to cut this. Now here's where it starts getting a little more critical. Again, keep in mind we want a nice, light press fit. So this shoulder, we know how deep that hole is, and we're going to make it about an eighth of an inch shallower here so that you don't bottom out. If you're lucky enough to have a nice saw like this back then, you could go ahead and cut that shoulder. But let's say that the, the guy that's doing this, maybe the farmer's going to help him out, maybe the, you know, for whatever reason, he's starting to build something himself, maybe he doesn't want to use his good saw. I know my father had a good saw, and us kids couldn't use it. There's obvious reasons to that. Um, everybody... Sure, everybody but me. Here it is. Everybody had this saw. You know what that is? That's a buck saw. Okay, for cutting firewood. Okay. But it has a nice wide blade and a tightening device. All right, this one, you tighten it up here. You could use this to go in and do your cutting if you wanted to. So you had your choice. 
a little uh, side note on the handsaw. Now, I'm sure you guys have old handsaws around the house. I like the metal. It stays sharper. It's a lot easier to use than the modern ones. It, it fits better. But do you see that little split nut in there? You can come up later and see it. There's a little split nut in there. This is a threaded insert. Like a, looks like a rivet, but it's got threads on it. You slide that in, and you take that little threaded insert, and there's a little tool that would tighten it down. All right, everybody's going to run home tonight and check this out, I guarantee you. That little threaded insert was not used in manufacturing after 1873. So that means if you got that in there, it's a pre-Civil War. Civil War are just after the Civil War. How common are they? Very common. I didn't pay five bucks for this. I think I paid a buck for it at the church auction or church yard sale. Five dollars. That's got, I think I paid a buck for it. That's got the threaded inserts. That was at a church yard sale. Somebody didn't like it because it was broken and old and they wanted their new craftsman. There's a dovetail saw that's got it. Another dovetail saw that's got it. Okay, and I've even found keyhole saws that have them. And, and these are laying all over the place. Civil War souvenirs. Hmm. Kind of looks like they used it in the Civil War. Amputees. Well, it kind of looked like that, anyways. So, anyways, you go in there and you would use your saw and you would cut your shoulders. Now it gets a little more touchier because you got to make the width of that just right. You would uh, start using a, uh, a chisel and your mallet. Get over this way out of everybody's way. This got a nice flat side onto it. You need to start paring this off until you got down close. You would then use what they call a slick. It also has a flat side and the chisel side. Okay. It would have a handle, maybe something like this, into there. And it, you would use it, this would be razor sharp, and you would use this like a wood planer. You would come down and just start planing off. Now keep in mind what I had said. This has got to be a press fit. Now think about this. This beam is going to be taller than this room. This post and this beam is going to be as long as here to the divider. So you got it laid down on a temporary barn floor and you're working with it. Now you get your crew over there and you stick it in there and it doesn't quite go in there. Pull it back out again. Pair off a little bit more. Stick it in there. Now you got your nice tight fit. So it took a little practice to, to get it because these guys didn't want to lift these beams anymore and they had to, right? So now you got your tendon, you got your mortise, and now you got to marry the two together and you need to drill a hole. So you'd use your boring machine again and you would drill a hole. Now you've seen the barns with the pegs, they go straight through, right? 
just like this. Go right straight through both pieces. But that's not how you would do it. What you're going to do is you're going to drill out your hole until that tip hits that uh, tenon, okay? And you pull the beam back out again and finish drilling right straight through. The next thing you would do is you come back and you got that little mark there, you'd offset your drill by about a sixteenth of an inch. Now you've noticed that your pegs are tapered. So when you drive a tapered peg in there, it's going to try to seek all three holes. And when it does, on that offset hole, it's going to draw this right down in solid because it's offset. It's going to pull it right down to the square shoulder, right down to here. That makes this beam and or this piece of wood and this piece of wood all like one. There was a little story I like about a guy that had a John Deere tractor, we'll call it, and it was one of those modern ones with, you know, like four wheels on each side and diesel powered and 15,000 gears and super low. And there was a guy that had a little barn, not much bigger than this half of the room. And he said, you know, if I go out there and wrap a chain around one post and I take off in that John Deere tractor, I'll snap that post off, that whole barn will fall over. And he says, I won't have to have any help getting it up. Get the chainsaw, chop it up, get rid of it. So he backs the tractor up and he wraps the chainsaw or the chain, logging chain around it. And he hooks it on the tractor and he gets up there with a big grin on his face and he drops it in a super duper low, guns that diesel engine, all four wheels are kicking in and <laughs> takes off. He says, well, that was easy. So he turned around, the barn had falled over, it fell over and he was dragging the framework to the barn. <laughs> now you know why, because once you tighten those up, and again, if you use green wood, and now we'll go to the, the uh, pegs. If you use seasoned wood for the pegs and green wood for the beams, that beam is going to shrink around that peg. You already got a nice tight fit, offset hole, tapered pin. That makes it super solid, like one piece of wood. Now, how do you make the, the pins? We'll take a little diversion here and make the pins. That was usually, eh, you got a 12, 14 year old kid that wants to learn how to be a, a master craftsman. It's a good job for him. He would take and get the logs. These are a little longer than what you need. And you would use a fro. It's not a cutting edge, it's a splitting edge. So it's a little duller and a flat edge. And you use your fro and pop it down in. Did you ever hear of the terminology to and fro? Well, you're using the fro and you're going to and fro and you're splitting that wood. And you would split it down in half, then in quarters, okay? Then you would go down and split it off in billets off of here, okay? And from the billets, you would do your square pegs, splitting it all down. That was a nice job for a kid. Then you gave him a look at this. You're going to train the boys to be, be men, right? You got another man tool here. This is called a shaving horse. Got to draw a shave. Another man tool, get to sit down. And it's basically a vise. As you push on this, this arm comes down and hangs on to your piece of wood 
and it's not going to move. That's, that's your wooden, portable wooden vise. So what you would do is you would take your square peg, knock the corners off so that you had an octagon. You would then take the octagon piece, okay, all the way up through, and you would start tapering it down all with the draw shave. And this is a nice job for a kid. Now I have another one of these uh, shaving horses at home and it's got a little hole up here. Just a little hole. And everybody asks me what, what that's for. I says, it's a gauge. Simple, you tell the kid, a teenager, you tell the kid, taper that till you can get it down in there maybe a hand width, maybe two hand widths, whatever, you, you tell them. If it falls through, throw it away because you've gone too far in the taper. I've had little kids, uh, second, third graders, come up and use this, and they're down there, and you can actually pick your teeth with it. This comes right down the needle point. But they love it, you know, and they get the feel of it, and they understand what's going on. So that's what the gauge hole was. And when it goes up just so far in the, into the gauge, then you know you've got it. Now you make your pegs out of, by choice, locusts. Anybody work with the, uh, see I did hook up on that. And it wasn't the saw. Has anybody ever worked with locusts? Okay. You definitely want to cut locusts when they're green because there's a reason why they use them for fence posts, because as the locust dries, it gets as hard as steel. It is hard. Uh, I think my dad was building our second home, and I was annoying the heck out of him. I was about 12 years old, and I wanted to help build the house. So he found this locust limb that he had cut off in the yard, and it was about that, well, that long. And we had a fireplace that he was putting in. And he says, here. So he gives me one of his old saws, which was probably dull to begin with. And he gives me this locust log that was like this, that's been sitting there all summer long. And he says, just cut it in one foot pieces and we'll use it for our new fireplace. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I am sitting there with that saw. And a half hour later, I didn't even have a little groove into it. It was seasoned locust. My mother finally took pity on me <laughs> and came out and told me, you were annoying your father, weren't you? <laughs> he kept you busy for a half hour. Don't annoy him. So anyways, they'd use locusts. They'd get the green locusts. They'd make these about two weeks in advance so that they were dry, drier than the wet logs when they came in and built the barn. Dry pin, wet beams, they would shrink around the pin and that's why the octagon shape up here so it wouldn't twist and turn. So now we got our beams built. Um, we got to raise it up. So the apprentice uh, and the, the uh, master carpenter, they go, you know, our job's done. So the farmer would call in, and you've seen the pictures before with the barn raising where they had many, many, many people. Uh, they would come in and raise the barn up and help the, the master craftsman would stick around because he knew how the barn went up. He'd be the supervisor. So now they'd bring out two posts and lay them down. They'd bring out their beam that would go across and they would put them together. Now remember I said a nice press fit? This is how they would get them in there, okay? It's called a beetle or a commander. Um, it's kind of like playing croquet with the, end of the, with the end of the log. Picture it down here, and you just go up there and you just lambaste that thing until you drove it as far as you could then you would take your other little hammer and you'd drive a peg into it. So now you've got two posts and a beam laying there. And of course, all the same time that's going on, you've got your cross braces that you've got to tie in all at the same time. That is called a bent. 
So now we got to put the first bent up. One of the things that would help them out is they would get a tree uh, out in their woodlot and they would anchor it down into the ground and they would put block and tackles up above. Now this was not to lift this bent up, it was to take the pressure off of the, uh, the farmer's friends that were putting this up. So they have block and tackle, come down, another block and tackle, and up here, this rope would come down, they'd wrap it around the beam, and they would either take horses or manpower, and they're just constantly putting pressure on as the bent's going up. Now, how'd they get the bent up there? We already know that these beams, this six-foot beam right here, is all I can do to carry that around. Now they've got bigger ones. You got hundreds and maybe thousands of pounds, depending on the size of the barn. What they would do, the master craftsman would call the shots. And he would line up a bunch of guys along that beam, post out there, beams here. And on his command, they would go down and pick that up. They'd have maybe a little piece of wood or something underneath this thing, get their fingers, and they would bring it up to here. When they did that, you get a couple of kids to take some sawhorses and throw it under there, and they could relax. Okay, and that's about as long as you're going to relax because then you got to get those four bents up into place. From that position, the next position on command would be up to here. All right. At that point, they would have two sizes of pike poles. Pike pole is nothing more than a sapling with a forged... Um, I'm still looking for one if anybody knows where I can get it. It would be a forged piece of steel that would come up into a point, okay? And they would come in eight ten-footers, they'd be the short poles, and then they'd have maybe 14, 16-footers for the longer poles. So they got one team of guys here lifting by hand, one team of guys right behind them with the short poles, the eight, ten footers. On command, they would go from here, the sawhorses, up to here. At that point, this other team would come in with their pike poles and jam it in. Now, it would be about here. You don't feed it this way. The whole movement on command is to lunge forward. That would take it up to about eight, ten foot level. The team that was over here lifting, when these guys said they had the, the beam up there with the short poles, they would fall behind and grab the taller poles and jam in and on command they would take it up to the 90 degree mark. Now, as they took it up to the 90 degree mark, they would already have a, a board scabbed on to it and they would come down to the sill and scab again and that would keep their bent up into position. Now they come over on the barn floor and they build the second bent and they would do the same thing. Now it gets a little trickier up there because as they're coming up there you have some smaller beams that the guys are, they can pretty much hit the height of it or stand on something. And they got to hold this beam up so that when this comes up, this bent, it's got to go into the holes and uh, the tendons into the mortises. And then somebody's got to drive a peg into there. So now you have two bents up and you've got a beam coming across here and here. Any braces, they got to go in there all the same time. Now, I failed to mention that the sill that the bents are going into, they have mortises. 
and have tenants on the ends of these beds. So they've already got them lined up and you have a couple of guys with crowbars guiding it in. So as this is going up, they got to guide it into the pole or into the holes down here and maintain this without losing it and then end up killing a bunch of your friends, you know, with all that weight. So now they get four bents up and it is then break time. The wives already have the goodies all lined out. They got saw horses with boards on it, all the foods out. And it's about noon time after getting these four bents up and they go out and they have their lunch. And then after lunch, they go up and put their uh, rafters up for the, for the roof. Remember, we were constructing this, and we said that this had to fit this. Well, this may not fit the next one. Have you ever heard of the term marriage marks? Marriage marks is where they would take a chisel and their mallet, and they aren't going to get fancy on lettering, and they would put a mark and the same mark down here. They know that that goes into there. Don't flip it around, guys. This end goes into there. If you have an older house and get to the attic or a barn that you can see, Look up near the top. This come out of a house. You see the V and four ones. All right. Well, if we all remember from school on Roman numerals, that's not nine. Nine is an X with the one in front of it. These are just merely marks so they know what's going on. If you look... There's another V over on this side and four marks. The V's come in the center. Now this particular house had about nine different rafters up there and I got permission when they're knocking it down to chop them off because they're in pretty bad shape. But that gives me an example. The next one had a V and eight marks or three marks, V and two marks, et cetera, et cetera, right down to the V. Um, so they knew which pair was going to go together. They would do the same in the barn. Around 1835-ish, and I say it that way because most of you probably have cell phones. When the cell phones came out, did you run out? I bet you this group, I bet you most of you didn't run out and get a cell phone. Mm -mm. And if it was my late wife, she still had a rotary phone because she liked that. So when there was technological changes in these tools, times overlapped, okay? It might have been five years or ten years or three years before you got a cell phone. So it's kind of hard to put dates on things. But about 1835, and I won't get into it because I don't, I understand enough, but not to explain it. There was another way to make these beams, same way, but another theory, whereas you could pick up any of them and they would all go together. So the chances are, after 1835, most of the barns that you're familiar with will not have the marriage marks, okay? Anybody wants to understand that, I can explain that later on. If you get an old one prior to 1835, early 1800s, you might find the marriage marks and like that house. So basically, that's, that's it. Uh, the farmer was left to put up his uh, boards, uh, his nailers. He was left up to making the shingles, which were just flat boards. They weren't tapered. They were just flat boards on a bigger wider logs, they look kind of like that, the shingles, and you'd start on the bottom and you put the next one up and you overlap all the gaps and, 
and whatnot, but that would be your shingles. Um, if you got that elaborate. And if the farmer, after 20 years of working the land, wore the land out, he knew how to put this together. Him and his friends put it together. They didn't build it. Master Carpenter and his apprentice did. So they could go up there and they could pop, and in reverse, pop all the pegs out and take the barn apart, throw it on a wagon, go 20 miles down the road, and he could put it back up again. Uh, it's a matter of getting somebody, and that's simple enough, to make the pegs again, new pegs. So it was easy enough for him to move the barn. And I've seen some barn moving equipment. There was, a, a, trying to think, there was a pretty good sized roller, and then they had uh, like a wheel, but it had a square hole into it, so you could put the square wheels on the ends of the logs and, and just roll the whole thing. They'd roll it, check up the barn, roll it, and they could roll the barn off of the foundation, usually when it's still on the ground. Well, you haven't said um, why there's the drop-off on the threshing barn. Because they went from a flat land barn to a bank barn. Uh, eventually they figured it out that if they moved the barn up to a bank and put a wall underneath, they now have a uh, place for animals. All right. As time went on, they had maybe a couple of milking cows. They needed another building, so they used the same barn. I've seen it out around the area where they've taken several of these and made them like a long barn out of them, but they're individual barns. Um, then they, because the fields got bigger and they got more wheat and they can thrash more. Um, but eventually they're bank barns. You can usually tell where the original barn sat because there's probably still some big rocks out there uh, for the corners, but they always located them with the prevailing winds so that the barn doors where the wind could blow through and that was generally east and west. You'd have west winds so the barn doors would be east and west. But it's fun to go out and, and look and say, that barn's still sitting right where they built it, still pointing east and west or yeah, the wind's blowing, okay. That's why that barn's turned just a little bit. Um, somebody else had a question? Your large mallet there on the floor, what did you call that? A beetle? That's a beetle or a commander, or How just, or just together, a big, large mallet. Apart when they're using it. Why? No, how, how is it put together? Um, it's got a little wedge in here. Oh. So when they put it in there, and again, this might have been green, this might have been dry, and they bored a hole in there and they made a nice press fit. And then they put a wedge in there just to make it even tighter. This one's starting to loosen up a little bit. Question? Yep. Most of the barns around here are painted red. Why red? Cheap. Red was cheaper to uh, make uh, red paint than it was uh, white paint. Uh, it was... It was <laughs> Red was the cheapest color paint that you could get. Okay. Why are the barns <coughs> Afterwards, I'll tell you about my grandfather and his red barn. Okay. Why are the barns south of here painted yellow? Later in life, uh, more paint became available. Okay. Most of them. Here in yellow barn south. But yeah, I, I've never noticed that, but I would say, don't know. <laughs> Don't know. Red was the cheap paint. Yeah. Usually it was just weathered barn. Then when they wanted to preserve the barn, red was the cheapest one. If you look at some of the old, real old buildings, or um, you can't get pictures of them, but the, the real old buildings in the villages, the wooden ones, were white on like the main street, and the rest of them were red because it was a cheaper paint. Yes. I think another reason they had to drop off 
was that because they do it on the flat land also, they don't build up to it, but so you can put your barnyard on one side. Right. You can keep the doors open and you can feed the cattle without them coming into the barn. You can feed them that way. And they can set it up. And it was interesting. Somebody, I was talking and one, uh, somebody said, when they thrashed, once in a while they uh, would use an oxen or a horse instead of a flail. Wherever my flail ended up now, it's over there. Uh, instead of using the flail to on the wooden floor, they would use a horse or an oxen to walk on it. And I said, look, for about five years when I, between 45 and 50 years old, I finally got a horse and did a lot of horse riding, worked with the sheriff's department uh, volunteer in search and rescue and whatnot. And the first thing that horse would do, the minute I get on him or start to move him, he'd raise up his tail and you know, his lunch would come out that end, you know. And I'm thinking, you're going to go out and you're going to thrash with this thing? There was a secret to that. They made a concoction that would actually bind the horse up. They would use them and that, or the oxen and then make another concoction, which would kind of make them a little looser. <laughs> So it, that made sense to me then, but they would, they would have that. Um, wagons, when they, uh, they used to come in one side of the barn, unload on the mouse, and drive out the other side. So one of the ladies in the horse club goes, well, wait a minute, my, my, barn, my barn's a bank barn. They didn't drive them out the other side. Well, the center post in some of those is removable so that they can, the center post and the wooden bay, they can take those out and they drive the team in, they can actually turn around and go right back out again. So there's all different types of things. Somebody back here had a question? And this gentleman. Uh, how long do they age the logs before they debarked them? Uh, you didn't. You cut them and you debarked them. You wanted them green so that when you got them up there, those green uh, logs would shrink around the dried. Yeah, that might be too. And it didn't hurt anything, not those cracks. Yes, sir. Uh, our barn initially was a English threshing barn. Okay. Uh, at some later date, it became a hip roof barn. Yep. What era was that typically uh, that design change? Now this is after the barn was after used. the barn was up. It was de that's to get more space in the uh, in, in the mow. Uh, I've heard that um, that it was because of the, uh, the the forks that they wanted more room up there and and you could store more the bales. Uh, everything was loose when. Yeah. In the period I'm talking, I'm, I'm in the early 1800s. So it would have to be late 1800s, maybe, uh -huh. mid to late 1800s. Again, yeah, it's we that. We still have a rail, a, a monorail, yep. with a, with a uh, block and a uh, spearing yep. device that would come down into loose hay, mm -hmm. and then it would collapse, or the teeth would collapse, and they could lift it up off of the wagon. Yep, off the wagon, the put it out in the mouth. And do you know that that was the worst invention that they could have possibly done as far as the barn was concerned? Because up in the, up in the peaks, you generally had another cross brace up here. Yeah. And when the guy that came out uh, to install, the first thing he'd do is cut that brace. And eventually that barn started moving and the roof was starting to sag and collapse, and then the water would come in and ruin the top sills, and that's, you know, yeah. they just lost it. They raised, <coughs> they raised the ridge of our barn a foot or more when they put a new roof on last year. Did they? Or where just exactly that it happened. And, uh, exactly, and that was the worst thing, the worst invention they came up with. Sure, sure you've been to a few Amish barn or anything? Uh, I haven't, but a quick story uh, at an Amish friend that 
Um, I was operations manager for Timber Harvester for a couple of years uh, where they made the band saws. And we have, uh, Henry was making, he had his own machine shop and he was making some stuff. So I went up there one day to catch up to him and his wife says, uh, I says, where's Henry? He says, oh, he's out to a frolic. Went, Wait a minute. Okay, now we got a little language barrier here, you know. A what? And she says, to a frolic. And then she told me. It was a house raising. That's the word they use for house raising. I had fun when he came back. I said, hey, your wife told me you were out frolicking. And, well, I wasn't out frolicking. And he says, I was at a frolic. And then I had to explain my term of frolic, and he had to explain his term. And that got really interesting. So, yes. I've been, I went, I've been about five of them, but they put, uh, I went to one that was a, heat, a big barn in the heat. Mm -hmm. They started at 6 in the morning and put hay in it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they're, they're fast. They're fa <laughs> Mennonites are fast too. All right, um, I could go on and on. Uh, it depends on what you guys want to do. Uh, if you want to, you know, come up and take a look at this. If you got questions, I can explain a, a little bit of the other. I do want to share one more thing with you. It's one of my pride and joys. This is a, uh, I'm sorry about this, but no, I'm not because I like this thing. This is a pit saw. All right, it's like a two-man saw, only it's operated vertically. Very interesting where you, it's, it's flimsy, okay? And you have two men. You have the sawyer who's on top. He's the man that owns the saw. And you had the pit man with a great big, bigger hat than I am on a 95 degree day. And he's down in the pit and they roll the log over the top, snap a chalk line. The sawyer lines that saw up to the line. All right. And when he's ready, he hollers down. And the pit man's got another handle on here. I got to make one. And he pulls the saw down. And the, Sawyer pulls it back up, lines it back up. Now you want to make sure that when you're making a barn floor, that it's nice uh, straight. Two inch wide boards, 20 feet long, okay? They can make five in eight hours if you're a good team. Uh, good team. Eventually, uh, probably a pit man He's down there doing this and getting sawdust in the eyes and he's going, boss, I got a better idea. Throw the handles away. Take five of these blades, put your two inch spacers in, and the boss is going, wait a minute, what are you nuts? I, I'm having enough trying, trying to line up one. He says, you want me to line up five? He said, no, 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 no. Put them under pressure up here, down there, so it's nice and rigid. And he says, hook it up to a water wheel. And he says, now you've got a sash saw. Shaker, Quaker, shaker, shaker lady. I was sitting in spinning yarn one day. And she's out watching the men folk out there with a pit saw. And she's laughing. She goes, waited until they came inside. She says, I got an idea. <laughs> yeah, women don't have ideas. Men are doing the work. Leave us alone. Just no, I got an idea. Get a great big piece of round metal and cut teeth all the way around it and hook it up to that water wheel. And that's how the buzz saw came. And that revolutionized everything. So thank you, Douglas, for coming. No problem. Uh, also, I want to make sure anybody that has not signed up yet would like a copy of the Barnes of Penfield, please do that. But also, remember this book. It's a great book on Barnes of the Genesee County by Daniel Frank, and it's one that everyone should actually read. Uh, it's here from the library. You can probably sign it out at any point in time. But please enjoy this book. You were recommended that. Oh, uh, yes. Yep. And this shows the, a lot of the process. Cameras were only used for still shots when they first came out. So uh, eventually uh, they started taking still shots of barns and things like that. So rare that you see an actual barn uh, raising in that book and it goes down through the process.
Who did you say the author was? Daniel Frank. Fink. 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 Daniel Fink. And Eric Salone makes little books. I got some back there, and he explains a lot of this process, too. Uh, all righty. I'm all done here, but I'm going to...